and it leads us into the next part of the evening. Um, I would like to invite Dr. Matt Pritchard um, to come and give our keynote talk. This isn't Matt's first visit to Otley, because I know he's been involved with your science festival in the past, and as well as being part of the magic circle and having a PhD in physics from Durham, he also is doing a project on, called Words on Wonder, which he will explain more on in just a moment. So welcome, Dr. Matt Pritchard. Evening. This is what I love doing. So have a look at this video up here that should be popping up. And then it goes horribly wrong. So, uh, just out of interest, who was, uh, who was thinking you're looking at a mirror there? And then actually turns out it's just simply a, a hole in a piece of cardboard behind my broken mirror. So watch again and you'll see how, uh, how obvious it is when you know what to look for. You can see the creases move on the cardboard. And this type of thing, just everyday objects behaving in strange, fascinating, slightly chaotic ways really fascinates me. So uh, this next video, see if you can spot something really strange about it. So again, I'll, I'll play it, so look out for some, something to change. So there's no film special effect there, it's just me playing around with a mirror in a certain setup. And uh, uh, perspectives fascinate me as well, so this is something literally I made yesterday. So I'm, I'm trying to turn this into a template, so if anyone's interested, come and ask, ask me afterwards and I can share a template with you when it's, when it's done. So, it's Valentine's Day tomorrow. So let's have a Valentine's Day sort of trick or science trick. So roses are red, violets are blue, something above isn't true. There's no red in this picture at all. In fact, all the red is actually grey and it's just this lovely colour illusion. When you have a, that cyan colour in the background, it creates that illusion. So for me, I'm fascinated by the idea of wonder. So I, I want to tonight talk about wonder and this word is, is written in a, in a rather strange way because if you turn it upside down it reads exactly the same so it's what we call an ambigram it's a, a special type of word that you can reflect or rotate and it will read the same or will show a different word and so we're going to explore the idea of wonder in this particular uh, section of the evening now I, I'm a Christian and about two years ago I was at my church down in Birmingham and, and my church leader was talking about their weekend it was this lovely crisp winters weekend blue skies snowdrops starting to pop through birds tweeting lovely and she was saying about how beautiful creation was blah 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 and then throw away comment at the end so who needs the Big Bang Theory and that slightly flippant throwaway comment really started to sort of disturb, maybe even annoy me, because uh, I studied a lot of cosmology at university, the, the origins of the universe. And for me, the Big Bang Theory was, yeah, a big part of my life, but also I gained so much from understanding about the Big Bang Theory. So what I'd like to do is just not even do a complete overview, but just a little hint at some of the fascinating items of wonder that come out of it. Now, uh, when I talk about Big Bang Theory, often people think about the TV show. So uh, the basic idea comes from a change in thinking. So originally, going back hundreds of years, people used to think the Earth was at the centre of the universe. And then in this picture here, you can see they've got different cycles going uh, as heaven gets deeper and deeper. You've got the clouds and then the moon and the sort of planets that you can see and eventually the stars and then heaven up there. And we have this idea, the Earth's at the centre, everything revolves around the Earth and everything's predictable. We've known for thousands of years we can predict what the sky is going to do. We know the moon's there tonight, tomorrow will be there. And we can start predicting in a hundred years, it'll be down here. It's all clockwork. And because it's clockwork, people didn't think there was a beginning to the universe. Uh, they didn't think it's end. It, everything just moved around cycles. And then something incredibly strange happened. Uh, there's an astronomer in America called Edwin Hubble. 
and he was looking at his telescope and he was looking at galaxies and he noticed in his observations that all these galaxies were moving away from him. The further away the galaxies were, the faster they were moving away from him. And that really disturbed him because that completely broke this idea or even the idea that the Earth is going round the sun. And so just for a moment we're going to pause because what we've got here and perfectly illustrated by my daughter is these two uh, sort of modes of thinking. We've got that wow, that moment of surprise. And then we eventually what we do is we discover what's going on. And often I think we rush from the wow to the how. We, we're often scared of that moment of ignorance or that moment of mystery because it's, yeah, it, it's quite disturbing not knowing, isn't it? And, and we jump ahead. And before I jump ahead to explain how we interpret these galaxies moving away, I just want us to dwell for a few moments just on this idea of mystery. And I've got a couple of quotes that I want to share with you. The first is by a magician called Ian Rowland. So uh, he makes these wonderful, impossible objects by cutting up playing cards. And he says, wonder is the joy of the gap between what we experience and what we understand. And yes, that moment of not knowing can be scary, but it can also be truly wonderful. And then there's a, a journalist and an advocate for the Muslim faith, Ramona Ali, who said recently to me, mystery is the oxygen of humanity and faith. And actually, if, if we'll, life was devoid of mystery, I think actually, well, we'll be much poorer for that. So sometimes we can want to jump ahead. But I would encourage you just to embrace mystery a little bit more because there's some really fascinating things we can learn in that moment of knowing and not knowing. So let's, let's return to our galaxies moving far apart and I, I want to try and explain it in terms of an ant infested balloon. So imagine we've got a balloon and uh, this here, this is uh, Gerald here and Gerald goes to sleep and wakes up the next day and all his ant friends have scampered away from him. He's a bit disturbed, goes to sleep, and then the next night they move further away, and the next night they move further away. And he can't understand it because he's an ant, and he lives in this effectively a two-dimensional world, scampering on a surface. Why are all his friends moving away from him? Well, to us, to our perspective, it's straightforward, isn't it? The balloon is getting bigger. His world is getting bigger, and that's why everyone's moving apart. The further away his friends are, the faster they go. And in fact, Mabel here, and Alfonso down here, he, they're noticing their friends are moving away further away, faster they're going. How do you explain it? Simply, the balloon's getting bigger. How do we explain the galaxies are moving away from us? Simply, our universe is getting bigger. Simple as that, really. But then people started asking the what if question. If the universe is getting bigger, what would happen if we reverse time? Because if we reverse time with the balloons, things get smaller and smaller and smaller. And eventually, Gerald, Mabel and Alfonso are on top of each other's heads. Eventually, at one point in time, and we can calculate this, everyone's in the same spot. And we can do that with the universe. We can work out that if we reverse time at a certain time, and currently we think it's 13.7 billion years ago, everything was at the same spot. And weirder still, what scientists believe is 13.7 billion years ago, there was nothing. No space, no time. Can you imagine time not existing? And then suddenly we get this huge release of energy. And over time, this energy, well, it starts being turned into matter. The, the only equation I'm going to use tonight is this one. I think, since we're all familiar with E equals MC squared, or at least we've come across it in pop culture, energy is equivalent to matter times a constant C, which is the speed of light. And because energy can be used to turn into matter, we can turn that energy release at the start of time into stuff like galaxies. So 13.7 billion years ago, we get this huge release of energy, over time, this starts cooling down, clumping together, we get stars forming, and eventually we get planets, and eventually we get life. 
So where did that energy come from? Uh, thanks to uh, Michelangelo and slightly doctored by Matt Pritchard, uh, we have this idea that we have God on one side and heaven, and suddenly God's so effectively gone bing, and then we've got the earth and Adam appearing. But what we've just done is we've, we've taken a mystery from the realms of science and, and we've expanded it, we've extended it, we've moved it into the realms of philosophy and, and theology. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I think we need to recognise when we're doing the transition. But science leads us, these mysteries, into bigger thinking. So that's one mystery that comes out of the Big Bang. It's, it's, it starts asking questions about our origins and also maybe our destiny. If, if the universe is getting bigger, what will happen? Will it slow down? Will it contract? Will we get a big crunch? Interestingly, the first person to suggest our modern day idea of the Big Bang was a Catholic priest called George Lemaitre. He was a, a priest and also he was a physicist. And he looked at Einstein's equations and thought, hang about, this equation you've done could describe a universe that's expanding. Einstein hated the idea, but it was a person of faith who came up with the idea of the Big Bang. Not like you might imagine today that it's uh, the atheists who come up with this idea because it eliminates God. No, a person who believed in God was quite happy with the idea that the universe could have a beginning in, in this manner. But there's another mystery that comes out of studying our universe, and, and Michael hinted at it earlier, because if we, if we look at our, just our solar system, if the Earth was a little bit closer to the sun, we'd burn up and we'd die. And if it was a bit further from the sun, we'd freeze and we would, we'd die. If gravity was stronger, we'd be crushed and we would die. If gravity was weaker, the air that we breathe would escape into the atmosphere and we would die. If uh, water froze at a different temperature, we'd die. If carbon bonds at a different level, we'd die. Can, can you see there's a pattern here? We live in what's called the Goldilocks zone. Not too hot, not too cold, not too strong, not too weak, not too big, not too small. And more than just that, we live in a universe that would appear fine-tuned, that all these fundamental constants that we put into our equations, if they were out by tiny fractions, we wouldn't have a universe like we have today. We definitely wouldn't have life. But when we start thinking about fine-tuning, we think about someone doing that, don't we? So just to help illustrate this idea, and maybe one of the mysteries that comes out of this, I'm gonna put this envelope here. And I just need two people just to come and help uh, be the hands of chaos. At this point, at primary schools, everyone puts their hands up. Uh, with the older audience, everyone's like, no. <laughs> we knew this moment would come up. Why is it now? Two volunteers. Oh, thank you. And brilliant. Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause. They come up. <laughs> so just for symmetry, if you could go around on this side. What's your name? Natalie and Tom. Thank you, Natalie and Tom. So we're going to do some uh, mixing up of these cards. We're going to shuffle them, but under pressure, sometimes it can be tricky to sort of do these shuffling. So we've got these trays here. All I'm going to ask you to do is smoosh the cards together, which is what four-year-olds do, just like smoosh them like this, if you want mind. Just mix them up, be the hands of chaos. Once you've done that, put them in a, a loose pile in the middle. And then you have a choice. Just lift off any number of cards you want. You can lift like two cards or a whole chunk of cards. Up to you. Thank you, Natalie. You can do one if you want. It, it won't work, but it's fine. We can do one if you want. You are the hands of chaos. No, seriously, if you want to do one, it's up to you. Great, thank you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take your cards. I'm going to turn them over so they're now face up and swap them. So, if, Tom, if you could just pop them there. And we'll just smoosh face up into face down. Yeah. I can see you're like naturally a neat person, which is bad for this role because uh, we want a bit of chaos, but not too much. Okay, if you could group them into a bit of a pile, lift off any number of cards you want, and then we'll do it again. Great. Thank you. This one's here. I'm going to flip them and swap them, and we'll just join them in. In fact, since we're here, I'm just going to recombine the whole lot into this pile here. Now, Tom, there's that black envelope behind you on the chair. If you could just reach and grab that 
open it up, there's a piece of paper inside there. If you could just read just what's on the outside for me. On the outside? Yeah, please. There will be 23 Facebook cards. So in this pile of chaos of face up and face down, there should be 23 face up cards. So let's uh, just see what we've got here. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. 16, 17, can you feel the suspense? Uh, 18 there, uh, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 23 face up cards in that part. But thank you, it's a tiny bit more. Tom, if you can open up that piece of paper, just one fold for me. The face up cards will come, uh, the face up cards contain 16 black ones. So the face-up cards here should have 16 black cards. So we've got one there, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen face-up black cards. But there's a little bit more. Tom, if you could open it up uh, one more for me. All of the face-up red cards. All the face of red cards are hearts. So we've got three of hearts, nine of hearts, ten of hearts. All these here are heart. Off you go. Except the six of diamonds. Oh. Shall we give Tom, shall we give Natalie a few cards? So thank you so much. So my, my question to you with that was, was I incredibly lucky tonight? Or was I doing something uh, behind the scenes, orchestrating things? So just, uh, just a show of hands, who thinks I was incredibly lucky? Yeah. Unanimous. Who thinks there was something sneaky, orchestrate? Yeah, that was just a simple card trick with 52 objects. And you look at it and you go, hang about, there's something sneaky. I don't know what's going on, but there's something sneaky behind the scenes. I look at things like this, and countless other scientists have looked at fine-tuning and the Goldilocks zone and go, well, we could be lucky. We could just be asking this question because if it didn't work out, we wouldn't be here to ask that question. Or maybe there's a deeper science we don't yet understand. Maybe there's something or someone behind the scenes orchestrating things. And, and, and that's another mystery we, we don't yet know the answer to. But it's something worth thinking about. It's a, it's a question that moves out of the science realms into bigger realms. But for some, it's a hint towards maybe there's some other forces at work in the universe and what we can just see and test. So, my church leader asked this question, who needs the Big Bang Theory? Well, I hope just that little hint of just something like studying a bit of science leads on to some big questions as well. And, and that's sort of what we try and do with the project. We try and introduce them to science and, and get students thinking some of the questions, not necessarily giving them answers. The, the Bishop of Manchester, David Walker, says, awe and wonder are like love. You know them when you feel them, but they're awfully hard to define. And do you know what? I've been for years asking people, what, when I say the word wonder, what, what do you understand by the word wonder? And it's, it's, you know, it's a really hard word to get your head around. And there hasn't been that much scientific studies about what wonder is. We're, we're interested in curiosity. We're interested in awe and these other big epistemic emotions, thinking sort of emotions. But we haven't really thought much about wonder. And so very informally, I started asking people, just interesting, fascinating people, a mix of scientists, philosophers, theologians, artists, magicians, friends and friends of friends and then other interesting people that inspire me and this is what the Words and Wonder project is. There's about 110 interviews live now with a whole host of people. Helen Sharman, Britain's first astronaut. We've got underwater photographers, we've got world leading con artists who consult casinos around the world and bishops of Manchester and all these people are talking about their work and their thinking around what wonder and curiosity is. So I want to share just a few insights from this. So the first one's by my friend uh, Richard McDougall, who's a magician. And he says, a sense of wonder is a sense of humility. 
of knowing we don't know and embracing that. And we, we've looked on that, that actually, when you, you come across new grounds, it's, it's uncomfortable, but it's also quite humbling. Uh, Roger Bretherton, who's a Christian positive psychologist, uh, that's a technical term, they, they focus on the positive side of psychology rather than all the dysfunctions. And he says the contradiction of wonder is to be personally elevated, because it feels great to wonder and be curious, and yet cosmically humbled at the same time. There's this weird uh, thing going on of being like raised and yet lowered at the same time when you wonder, when you ask big questions. Underwater photographer Zena Holloway uh, likens wonder to being deep underwater, attached to nothing, but connected to everything. Uh, when you wonder, you often feel part of something so much bigger than yourself. There's connections there. And there's a, 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 what's called a hyper-realistic fine artist. Uh, he basically paints pictures of things that you think would be genuinely real. So Alastair Gordon, who, that's just a painting that is, everything on that picture is paint. Uh, paint. He says, there's wonder in the form of clouds and the taste of rain and the feet of con feel of concrete under your feet. We were made to look up rather than look down. Wonder raises our gaze. And if I was to really sum up 110 interviews, there'd be two things about it. The first one comes across in so many interviews, and this is this idea of slowing down. We live in a, a very fast world. Uh, a constant 24-7, uh, full of the ambient anxiety of constant notifications on our phones and just slowing down, we notice more. And this other, other concept of Vujardet, and, and you might be thinking, yeah, this, this guy doesn't know his French, he's got it all wrong. No, Vujardet is this idea of seeing something familiar, but in a new light seeing the extraordinary in the ordinary, the magical in the mundane. And uh, just a really simple example of this, I was having a picnic with my family this summer, and I spotted this huge battle between nature and engineering. This tree was planted right next to a fence, or the fence right next to the, uh, the tree, and you can see it's, in one case, bent the bars, but in the other case, the tree has literally swallowed up the steel bars and you can see the scar marks. If you were to cut this tree down right now, it would have the steel bars going through the middle. I just find that wonderful. And if I was being too busy and not noticing, I would have missed that. There's a, uh, he's, uh, an American scientist, he worked on the Manhattan Bomb Project and was so, I think, scarred by that project of the damage that some of his work had done, he went on to become a science teacher and then he opened the Exploratorium in San Francisco, uh, one of the first hands-on science museums. And he talks about this, and we've already hinted at it earlier, artists and scientists are the official noticers of society. And uh, I think uh, what Naomi was saying about the, there's a lot of similarities being between creative people and scientific people. Uh, we notice things, we, we, we spot things. And when we, pay attention to things, that can easily turn to adoration. The things that we give attention to, we adore. Our phones becomes perhaps an object of worship. And the, uh, the theologian Steve DeWitt, uh, in his book talking about wonder and beauty, says that actually wonder, in most cases, leads to worship. Uh, Often, sadly, with science, we get so caught up by the science, we end up worshipping the science ourselves. It becomes a sort of scientism, as opposed to going, wow, and wow, God. Or that's how at least I view it. So I look at things like this, this uh, Hubble Space Telescope image, and I go, that's beautiful. That's just dust and light going through, but it's beautiful. And I believe God created that. And by studying this, I have the initial wow, and then I turn that back in worship to God. And for me, so much of the science that I do is an act of worship. I'm a rubbish singer. I'm a rubbish dancer. But what I do love doing is discovering and exploring, and that's worship as well, because I'm turning what I'm learning and what I'm doing back to my God. 
Uh, I'm a parent. I've got two kids. I'm now looking after a third child in my care for a while. And I love giving presents to my daughters. And you know, if you give a present to someone and if they just look at it and don't unwrap it, then that's disappointing. If they look at it, unwrap it and throw it to one side, that's disappointing. If they look at it, open it, unwrap it and play with it, they get pleasure and I get pleasure. I get pleasure as the gift giver seeing them get pleasure. And you know what? I believe that's what God does. God, in a sense, the world around us is this big gift for us to explore, for us to discover, for us to unwrap and play with and to care for. And just as I get pleasure doing my science, I believe God gets pleasure from seeing me do science as well. He's not anti-science, in fact, he's pro-science. First job in the Bible was naming all the animals. Surely that's being a scientist, going out exploring, discovering hippopotamus, rhinoceros, and so on. Pig, dog, cat, as he, Adam, ran out of options for words. There's a, there's a verse in the Bible in Proverbs, and it's, uh, it's had a, an updated paraphrase. In, in the message version, it says, God delights in concealing things and scientists delight in discovering things. And I, I think, like I said, God gets pleasure in seeing us discover what he's created. But there's a question here, because often people say that science and faith are in conflict. That you can't believe one if you believe the other. And I, I just want to give you just one part of an answer to this. It's a, it's a big topic, but uh, since we've got a natural divide down here, this is side A and side B. So side A, eyes closed, heads down, so you can't see the screen. Side B, have a look at what's on the screen right now. Okay, look up side A. Side B, eyes closed, heads down. Side A, look at the screen. And everyone look up. My question to you simply, what was the symbol in the middle? What do we see? B. B. Okay, it's a wave. It's all B. Okay, we, what do we see? Thir so you saw 13. That's what you all saw, genuinely. Is that a B or is that a 13? Or is it both? Because some of you were looking at letters and you interpreted the middle as a letter. Some of you are looking at numbers, interpret it as a number. If I went home tonight, chocolate cake on my table, go up to my wife Sarah, how come there's a chocolate cake at home? Matt, flour, eggs, margarine, sugar, baking powder, cocoa powder, been in the oven, 180 degrees, 45 minutes, that's how come there's chocolate cake at home? Go home tonight, Sarah, how come there's a chocolate cake at home? It's your birthday. <laughs> Which answer's better, the recipe or the reason? Or does it depend on what you're wanting to look for? What question? Are you asking a how question? Or are you asking a why question? A mechanism question or a meaning question? Science is great at the mechanism, the hows, the whats. Things like faith is much better at asking the, the meanings questions, the reason questions, the significance, the how should I behave type of questions. Doesn't mean one's right and one's wrong. Doesn't mean you have to choose one or the other. I think you need both. You get a so much broader perspective if you have both. And by fighting over it, you miss out and you end up polarizing people, which is a, a massive shame. So uh, let's try this. Let's uh, grab a, a piece of cutlery. So I've just raided my kitchen. And I'm going to take the spoon. And for those at the back, so you can see, I'm just going to put a card on here. And my uh, task is really simple. I'm just going to... Hold on, Fred. I'm not going to swallow it. That's madness. What I'm going to do is going to try and twist it so it's upside down. Ta-da! Of course, oh, thank you. Of course, if you have a problem, if you're stood and there's a whopping great fork on either side of you, do it with a fork. <laughs> so I'll leave that as a mystery. This, the, the journalist and writer Dennis Covington, who did a, a big expose of the, uh, the, the sort of rattlesnake faith community in America, taught in his book, Mystery is not the absence of meaning, 
but it's the presence of more meaning than we can comprehend. And I, I, I love that. It's like mystery is not the end. It's the beginnings of something new, something bigger, something more exciting. I love this picture, this picture of Golden Gate Bridge. And right there in the middle, we've got the clouds there. When you're driving along, you've got two choices. Are you going to stop? or you're going to keep on going. So just out of interest, who's going to stop the car when you get the clouds? Who's going to keep driving? Yeah. You don't know what's ahead, and yet you still keep on going, don't you? Because you know as you go into clouds, you can see a bit further. And you can see a bit further, a bit further, a bit further, a bit further, until you've popped out the other side. At no stage have you seen all the way through. What you have done is little steps, and each time acted on it. And if you're getting too close to the edge, you adapt and you change. For many years, this next quote was on my, uh, my computer desktop screen. And it says this, faith is not the absence of doubt, it's the presence of action. Do you know what? There's always going to be mysteries. There's always going to be doubts. But you have a question, are you going to stop at that point? Or are you going to keep on going into the unknown, as Elsa might say? So that's, that's everything I want to share with you in that section. Uh, I, I just really want to encourage you to uh, embrace mysteries. And just because there might be things you don't know, doesn't mean you shouldn't explore, you shouldn't question, because actually there's some, sometimes something really wonderful on the other side. And for me, science is a great tool for wonder, because when I wonder, I worship. So thanks for your time. I look forward to your questions later.